All right, David, alcoholic addict. Thanks, everybody. We're going to dive in tonight. We're on page one, Bill's story. Woohoo! But before we start reading in the book, David's got a couple of, of uh, intros that he's going to read just to sort of set a little bit of foundation about Bill Wilson, one of our co-founders, and, and what we're going to be studying in the book. But before we get on to new business, uh, so to speak, I wanted to bring up a little piece of old business from last week. So one of our members, a good friend of ours who lives out here in rural Illinois with us, Ashton, is our resident ICU nurse and therefore medical resource. And she couldn't join us last week, but she went back and looked up a number of key words that have definitions within medicine that might be a little different, certainly than, you know, the dictionary definition of the way we look, uh, look at some of these words. And so we thought it'd be an interesting perspective to have the, you know, the medical industry's view on some of these words. So Ashton's going to share them in the chat and uh, she'll also put them in the WhatsApp group. So some of those words like psychopath and things like that, that we were having a lot of fun with last week. So Ashton, if you don't mind sharing those out so everyone can grab those and then Bert, copy paste those right, right into word. Okay, on to new business. And David, you want to get us introed here? Absolutely. I'm David. I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. So uh, thank you guys for all being here. So we're this is exciting, right? We're in the first chapter, the real official first chapter of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Originally, it was the second chapter in the first edition. Uh, the doctor's opinion was first. The doctor's opinion was moved to the forward of the book uh, because uh, and put in Roman numerals because this book is written for alcoholics, by alcoholics, from what I understand. So let's talk about Bill a little bit. I just want a little setup on uh, what a man he really was. And, I, you know, hey, we all have our own character defects and uh, shortcomings, and I'm not here to bash Bill and what he, uh, all the things that he may have done either in recovery or after. I, we're going to stay to the facts that read out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. But to set this up just a little bit about what Bill's life looked like um, as a child, so Bill's mother and father both left Bill when he was like 12 or 13 years old, and he was raised by his mother's uh, father, Grandfather Griffith, and uh, and I've read him many of uh, Bill's biographies, right? People have written about him. I, I, I got a, a slew of things that um, have been written about Bill, some historical facts about Bill Wilson, and they're amazing, So I, I but I'm not going to bring any of them to our attention tonight. What I'm going to talk about here is um, what Bill did in his... Uh, his drive at life. So if I'm going to play an armchair quarterback, I have to say Bill had a major uh, abandonment issues, right? Mom and dad both left, grandfather uh, uh, raising him, major abandonment issues. So he had this strong drive. Bill had an inferiority complex also. He's always trying to overcompensate for his awkwardness. Real tall, gangly guy, right? Um, not very athletic, but he came. To, he became the captain of the football team and the baseball team. You know, here's a guy who wasn't athletic, was really tall and gangly, but drove himself to the point that he was the captain of both those teams. In high school, he had no musical ability, but he learned to play an instrument, became the leader of the band. And I know how hard that is. I, I play piano a little bit, but my grandson's in, in uh, high school. He's a senior high school. He plays in the band. I mean, you don't just pick up an instrument and start playing. This guy really had some kind of talent. Uh, he had a very strong drive to succeed. So let's me set up. That's just a little bit of his um, adolescence years. So let's get into, um, I have a little bit of overview of Bill and what this chapter looks like for you. So when I'm working with new guys and any of my sponsees and I try to push, I, I try to ask them to look at the first eight pages of Bill's story. Look at it. Look at this chapter in two different ways. The first eight pages of Bill's story is what it was like for him when he was drinking. And the, we're going to we'll point out as we're going through this, the progression of this disease. And then pages 9 through 16, let's look at the recovery portion if we're willing to do the things that Bill did. See, um, what I'm trying to do here is identify with Bill, not look at the, the differences, look at the similarities here. And the, the, the best way for me to look at the similarities in Bill's story is did I think like Bill, drink like Bill, or feel like Bill? So let's highlight those things, let's circle those things, let's underline those things that I relate to. I mean, how many of us go to meetings, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, whatever your anonymous is, and you sit in a room and a guy was sitting there go, well, I've had five DUIs and I've been to prison three or four times. And I've been divorced six times and another guy talks about, uh, you know, that he's been uh, 
the prison and county jail and most of his life. Well, I mean, I don't necessarily identify with all that stuff. So those are the differences. But I mean, if you need to go do get 60 UIs to get here and stay here, please go ahead and do it. I just hope you make it back. But I'm just saying for me, I'm looking for similarity. So the main purpose of Bill's story is for identification. And as as are the other stories in the textbook. In the doctor's opinion, we learn the exact nature of alcoholism. We learn that we are powerless because of the allergic reaction the alcohol has to the alcoholic. Craving that comes with the first few drinks never, ever happens to the uh, normal drinker. And of the unmanageability resulting from a mind that cannot remember the, the allergic reaction. We start drinking again, even though we sincerely promise never to do it again. Without my consent, without my permission, I pick up a drink. And a Bill story will be 12th step by Bill Wilson himself. We will see the progression of the disease in his life. As we study the story, we should look for the effect of drinking on Bill that you too have experienced. We can look at what happened to him and say to ourselves, yes, that happened to me too, or no. That hasn't happened to me yet. As we study this story, ignoring the differences, such as he was from Vermont, he was a stockbroker, he was in World War I, look only for the similarities in the experiences resulting from drinking. Some of these will be noted as a, as a, prog a pr progress in our study for Chapter 1. We will also learn how Bill found, uh, found hope as a result of a visit from his longtime friend, Abby T., who became Bill's sponsor. While in Towns Hospital, Abby visited Bill and helped him take the actions of our 12 steps, which resulted in Bill having a spiritual experience. Bill tells what his life was like after taking the action, and he lived 36 years without ever taking another drink. So if we do what Bill did, we will get what Bill got. And that's pages 9 through 16, if we do what he did. And that's what I want to look at it today. So Bill began writing the big book in April of 1938 at his business office in a new, uh, uh, office of a New York member, Hank Parkhurst, uh, an honors dealer. And the address of that, that building was 17 William Street, Newark, New Jersey. Hank P., uh, whose big book story is The Unbeliever, and Ruth Hawk, which was the secretary credits Bill for writing the book. She took the dictation, typed it all up on a nice typewriter for us. And Hank Parker's is the reason why we got this thing published. So I've heard stories about, you know, Bill being the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And Dr. Bob not getting a lot of credit for being the co-founder. And actually wanted to give Ebby and Hank co-foundership uh, rights to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the reason why they probably did not do that is because Ebby and Hank Neither of them stayed sober. Uh, Hank drank again in April of 1940. So that would be really bad publicity, right? If, you know, it doesn't seem like it worked. But what we found out is Bill, Bob is a very humble man. And we didn't have social media the way we have today and, and the acknowledgement of people's sobriety dates and all. But by the time uh, the 12 and 12 came out and probably a little bit prior to that, people started acknowledging the fact that Bob and Bill were both co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank God for that. Um, and what I understand is, according to Dr. Bob's son, Bill and Bob never had an angry word, ever. That is pretty darn amazing, guys. And all those years, 15 years for Bob and 36 years for Bill, all those years. So um, I think that's it, my setup for that. And if you want to jump in, we'll just jump right into the reading. Awesome. Thanks, David. Guys, if you have any questions about that, put it uh, in the chat and we'll see if we can get that in an electronic format. I don't know if we're just talking. We got it printed out, but David's got it hidden somewhere. I have it. I'll find yeah. it. All right. Beautiful. So we'll share that in the future, in the not too distant future. Okay. So page one, guys, we're on the, what, Arabic numbers now. We're beyond the Roman numerals. Chapter one, Bill's story. War fever ran high in the New England town to which we new young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned, and we were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. Here was love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was part of life at last, and in the midst of the excitement, I discovered liquor. 
I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sailed for over there, was very lonely, and again turned to alcohol. I have the definition of sublime and prejudice. Hmm. Sublime is defined as awakening of uplifting emotions. And in the sentence, here was love, applause, war. Moments of awakening, uplifting emotions with intervals, hilarious. And prejudice, to prejudge, judge before examination. Um, in the sentence, I forgot about the strong warnings and the judgment before examination of my people concerning drink. One more time, definition of prejudice, Sam, nice and loud for everybody, because this is a really important word. One more time, please, Sam. Prejudice, to prejudge and judge before examination. This is going to come up a lot as we get through our illness. Okay, so yeah, and, and David's spot on because when we get into in the step two, we're going to be talking about prejudice. And Mark Houston's definition of prejudice is a preconceived thought or an opinion. So I got to let go of all those things. But this this prejudice. So I forgot the strong warnings at the end of that paragraph that um, we read here. It says I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudice of my people concerning drink. Grandfather Griffith warned Bill of drink problems in his family. He and what? Can you guys relate? I mean, we shake our family tree and a drunk or a drug addict falls out, right? And I knew I had drinking and drug problems in my family, but I ignored those warnings because I'm different than that. You, you don't understand. And, and it wasn't even an issue at this time because Bill's talking about, like, this is still hilarious. This is still funny. He's still exciting. Like, remember what it was like when you first started drinking and where there was no circumstances, no consequences? I mean, for me, it was for a very long time before that even came – to be uh, in fruition to me. The last thing on this page is, uh, is I was very lonely and I turned to alcohol. Very lonely is part of the spiritual malady, and here he is turning to his solution. Remember when alcohol was the solution? I remember when the alcohol was the solution. It took me out of that loneliness. It made me happy. It did things for me that nothing else could until one day it just could not do that for me any longer, and I was a prisoner to it. So Bill turned to alcohol. This is a, a first warning, a first uh, sight to take a look at here and, and pay attention to as we go through this progression of this disease in Bill's life. Now, if we were reading this, and, and it wasn't in the book called Alcoholics Anonymous, we were just reading a little story here, fiction or non, would we immediately jump to the conclusion that this person was an alcoholic based on this first paragraph? I don't think so, right? Because remember, back in Roman numeral 28, Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. So what, what are we reading that Bill's doing? Having a little fun, fueled by alcohol, getting a little lonely, turning to alcohol. Plenty of people, when they're feeling lonely or when they want to escalate their good time, drink alcohol. That does not make one an alcoholic. So as David has already said at least a, a couple of times, I think I heard him say, progression, we're going to see so many progressions. So how Bill's illness, how his drinking is going to progress, you know, which at the same time is really the sort of his, uh, his destruction is, is uh, progressing at the same time. But right now, he's drinking. Okay. We landed in England. I visited Winchester Cathedral. Much moved, I wandered outside. My attention was caught by a doggerel on an old tombstone. Here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot, whether he dieth by musket or by pot. And look at Rob put in the chat, everybody. That's a picture, right, of the actual tombstone with the doggerel. How cool is that? One is that on Scott? Look at this. We got multiple ones. And Scott's been there. How cool is that, everybody? Put it on your bucket list. Sorry, I'm screenshotting that photo. I wanted that. <laughs> um, so I have the definition for doggerel, which is irregularly written. 
um, in the sentence, my attention was caught by an irregularly, irregularly written um, on an old tombstone. And then I have, um, I did not write small beer, David. So if you could explain that. Um, and then also um, ominous. Oh, wait, we didn't get there. We're not there yet. Sorry, I'm jumping the gun. I got excited. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll circle back to you. So small okay. beer is, is a low alcohol beer, lower alcohol content. And we know this from our drinking days, right? You can drink that weak stuff like Miller Lite that I don't even know how much alcohol is in stuff anymore, three and a half percent, or you drink some of that heavy porter or stout stuff that's, I don't know, quadruple, right? All sorts of the range in that. And um, whether he dieth by musket or by pot, every time we read this, there's always a couple of grins and chuckles. We're not talking about marijuana here, guys. We're talking about pot of beer, right? Like a cup. So when I look at this thing and, and see if you relate to this, this is how I'm going to relate to this whole chapter. He wandered outside and then my attention was caught by a dog on her own too, so. Earl Hightower says this. I would listen to Earl Hightower 20 plus years ago, and I love how he says this. Driving down the road, just use this as an example. How many times did I have signs above me racing at 80 miles per hour down the highway, and I never even tapped the brakes? This is a bad, bad idea, and I just stayed on the pedal and the gas pedal the whole time. Bill's hearing, he's seeing and uh, getting a warning here, but totally ignoring the fact that this guy, it's somewhat hilarious, but at the same time, very true for us. This doesn't matter. This guy, either he was going to die by musket or, or by pot, by drinking. This, I, I never paid a heeded to them, those, uh, those signs, ever. I, I just didn't think they applied to me. I, just didn't, I, I knew I was smarter than that. And, and David always uses the example, I'll smarter or out muscle it. I, I, that's just how I've, I always operated. Bill ignores this whole fact here, and uh, a buddy of mine who's passed on sober uh, many years ago, he talked. To, he used to talk about that small beer. Is it's just low alcohol beer, as David pointed out here. Doesn't matter. I mean, even in Alcoholics Anonymous, a lot of times we we talk about non-alcoholic beer. There's still alcohol in that stuff, guys. Like I don't drink none of that stuff. I just got back from an Alaskan cruise. I was safe and protected the whole time I was there. A couple people asked me if I wanted a non-alcoholic daiquiri or whatever the drink is like absolutely <laughs> not <laughs> no i do not want that i'd be happy with that 18th cup of coffee thank you very much <laughs> one addiction at a time right all right moving on here you go sam ominous warning which i failed to heed go ahead sam give us that one we can pause again um Ominous is threatening, so a threatening warning, which I failed to heed. Okay, so now to carry my narrative a little bit, if we didn't know this was in a book about an alcoholic, a story about an alcoholic, now at this point, this is what's known as the literary construct of foreshadowing. Bill is letting us know that he was having almost like a, like a spiritual moment here as he was reading this, uh, the, the dog roll in the tombstone. It, 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 you know, he was having this moving moment at Winchester Cathedral. Something caught his eye to the tombstone. He read this. It resonated with him. I mean, I don't know if it's, you know, maybe Howard will, will have something to share at the end of the meeting about this. I can't tell you how it is that Bill maintained a memory of this and then came back and included it in the big book. My, uh, my belief is that he carried this with him, right? And that's why he's got it here. Ominous warning. This touched him. But he failed to heed that warning. Things are not going to go better for Bill as we keep reading. Bob was nice enough to post something here. Take a look at this, guys, in the chat. Date on the tombstone, May 12th. On the tombstone, Bob and Mill, Bill met on May 12th. Coincidence? Question mark. <laughs> Think about it, guys. That's you all guys, I got on that. <laughs> thank you. And guys, we're greedy, so I want to see all your beautiful faces. If you can come on camera, please do. Understand not everybody can, but if you can come on camera, please join us. Thank you. 22, 
and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation. My talent for leadership, I imagine would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. So I'm putting a little theater on that as I read it, because seriously, how can you just read that in monotone? That is not the way that Bill was thinking, right? I, I love that uh, little uh, half a paragraph there, because this is the way that I used to think. Such grandiosity. Oh, my God, I've had a little bit of success. Oh, my God, I got a compliment from my boss. It's only going to be a matter of time until he says, you know what, David, you're more qualified to run my company than I am. Will you please take over as president and I will serve at your helm? I totally get this kind of grandiosity and ego. First of all, 22 and a veteran of foreign wars. Big deal, right? And he's not unique. Everyone, you know, they're all that age, you know, give or take. Very frightening. But he got through it. He, he, he was leading some men. They had some sort of sense of appreciation for him. And coming out of this, he thought, well, I'm just going to keep this, this ball rolling. You know, if I can get it done in war in the armed forces, I can get it done, you know, on Wall Street, no problem. No doubt in his ability. All ego, right? And what we're going to see is part of that alcoholic personality that I think a lot of us have, this personality trait, is David mentioned, I do talk about this all the time, my approach to life pre-recovery was every obstacle could either be outmuscled or outthought, occasionally outrun. You know, self-propulsion drives us through life, and that's what Bill is talking about right here. He's not saying, yeah, maybe I'm going to ascend. He's saying, I, in my mind, I have a vision where I'm a big shot and I'm going to run a big company. So Howard was nice enough to send me a text, so let's go back, circle back to Cold Small Beer. So I was I, I stand corrected here. So uh, it says Coast Small Beer, which has gone, is that chilled or CILD, and the bacteria which was were nullified when heated. Plagues were spread through bacteria in water. So when the alcohol was heated, it killed the bacteria in the water, which returned which returned when it cooled. The alcohol contact was not a factor. The temperature was. Mm, all right. Happy to stay okay. corrected. Love that education. Yeah, thank absolutely. You, thank, yeah, thank you. This is a family here, guys. I, I appreciate anything. So, yeah, to, to David's point, back to, to that paragraph, <laughs> was Bill a good leader? you damn right he was a good leader. I mean, someone just posted in the chat the ring that his men gave him. I mean, that is because of his leadership. But as David pointed out here, my talent for leadership, I imagine, would be placed me in uh, head of vast enterprises. Let's watch the growing eagle. Let's pay attention to the progression of this disease, and let's pay attention to the growing ego. See, my sponsor is really good a big time about this. The, this is a disease of perception. This is how I view myself, the, my pride, how I think the outside world views me. This is how Bill thinks the outside world views him. This is his ego, driven by this ego. And we also know that uh, Harry Tebow says uh, the the ego has an uncanny ability to regenerate itself. Hmm. Bill's ego is generated big time, but I relate to it. So I'm, I'm only looking for a relationship here. I'm not judging Bill. I'm just looking for my relationship with this. Yeah. I mean, how can I ever sit in judgment of Bill when I know he produced this thing four years sober, right? I've been, I've been doing this 19 and a half years. Dave has been doing this 23. There's probably people on this call have been sober even longer. Could any of us think we could write this thing? <laughs> no way. Right? No way. Okay, so what's Bill going to do now, right, to get to the head of uh, vast enterprises? Law school. And, you know, we just introduced ego, you know, and Bill's increasing and progressing amount of it. Look at how many times the words I and me and my are used in this next paragraph. Count them off if you're interested. I took a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for a surety company. The drive for success was on. I'd proved to the world I was important. My work took me about Wall Street, and little by little, I became interested in the market. Many people lost money, 
but some became very rich. Why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. We had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk, that the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. I don't know if anybody's uh-huh. broken the seal on swearing yet, but is that a load of bullshit or what? <laughs> Go ahead, Sam. Um, I counted the eyes and my's, and I think if I'm not, I think there are 14. There might be 15. I might have miscounted, but um, just in this one paragraph. So I do have the definition of surety, um, which is up to interpretation because I'm not exactly sure myself what a surety company is, but this is what I researched. Um, It's the company that provides a line of credit to guarantee payment of any claim. Sounds right to me. So that is uh, my definition for surety and company. And then I have foreboding, a, a feeling that something evil is going to happen. So we had long talks when I would, when I would still her feelings that something evil was going to happen by telling her that men of genius concede their best projects when drunk. Thanks, Sam. So don't don't be shocked here, but his alcohol problem followed him back to the states. <laughs> it didn't just stay over in England. It followed him back to the United States here. And yeah, he went to law school and barely got through that, barely passed his final exams, but did get his certificate, never sat for the bar. Um, but he got interested in Wall Street, right? And now remember the times here. This is the roaring 20s. Lois and Bill couldn't get any real traction in the city. And this is how entrepreneurial and inventive and creative he was way ahead of his time. Bill was a very, very smart guy. I think we understand that by the writing in this book. Is it divinely written? Absolutely. Was there divinely people divinely put in his path? Yes, but Bill was a very smart man. So it talks about, let's look at the progression in this paragraph too. And one of the finals, I was too drunk to write, think or write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, it disturbed my wife. See the progression there? Identify with the progression. Mine's highlighted, underlined, and circled. I remember those times when that happened to me. And then it talks about, we had long talks when I could still hear forebodings about telling her that men of genius can see their best projects when drunk. I had this conversation with my wife. Mm-hmm. I lost a job working for a Fortune 500 company. You got to know my background a little bit, but this is not about me. I dropped out of high school. <laughs> I don't have a high school education. I got a job by working my way up the ladder in this company, making really good money, but did something really terrible and lost my job. I had to come home and tell my wife. This thing here that I will land back on my feet again, even though this is tragic. It's, the drinking is not my problem. I have very creative thinking. I will make this all work out. And she's crying and I'm crying. I'm crying about for me. I'm not crying for the family. This is, this is a self-absorbed self-centeredness by very truly. Mm-hmm. But men, have, uh, do you see the lie that Bill believes here? I believe that lie also. Matter of fact, I used to say this. If you don't drink, I don't trust you. Hmm. I used to think that to people. No, thank you. I don't want any more drinks. Then I don't trust you. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. I used to think that in my heart and heart. That's a lie that I believe. Bill believes the same lie here. It, it, it is absolutely a bald-faced lie. But look at the self-propulsion, right? The drive for success is on. So he's, uh, he's got a job as an investigator. He's going to school at night in law school. Um, you know, he's now on Wall Street and he's getting interested in the market. So, I mean, he's got presumably a full-time job, taking night classes, hanging around Wall Street and getting interested in that too. So he's a real renaissance man getting involved in a lot of things here. And it occurs to him, all these other suckers are losing money. I've learned a little bit and I bet I'm going to get rich doing this. And um, <clears throat> as he goes on with his law school, though, what's more important? 
the drive for success or the alcohol? Well, quickly, one is eclipsing the other because too drunk to take a test, right? Nearly fails it. Um, drinking is not yet continuous. Disturb my wife. So I'll just underscore again, obvious progression here. And then as I started off by saying, just a whole lot of BS in these statements. But how many times, even if, if it wasn't a well-constructed sentence, like, first of all, if he was really using that kind of language as he, as he was talking to his wife, she was probably falling for it for a long time, right? I mean, those are pretty well-constructed, sophisticated phrases. We said a lot less sophisticated things to justify our drinking for a very long time. By the time I had completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. The inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip. Business and financial leaders were my heroes. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight. Oh, I butchered that, guys. Out of this alloy of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. Living modestly, my wife and I saved $1,000. It went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and managements, but my wife and I decided to go anyway. I developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets. I discovered many more reasons later on. I have the definition of maelstrom and alloy. So maelstrom is a whirlpool. So out of this whirlpool of drink and speculation. And then I also have, oh, oh my goodness, wrong sentence. The inviting whirlpool of Wall Street had me in its grip. Now, this is the definition of alloy, which is mix and combine. Um, out of this combination of drink and speculation, I commenced to forge the weapon that one day would turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbons. So it's kind of interesting to me, and I, maybe I got this wrong, but I read this somewhere, I think in, a, in a, one of the biographies that I've read. Bill throws the word boomerang in the middle of that paragraph, right? It's like, dude, what's up with that? <laughs> well, his grandfather, Griffith, said nobody can make a boomerang the way they do in Australia down under, right, mates? <laughs> Can't do it. Well, Bill was a driven man, and he was able to make a boomerang. So I think he's like kind of patting himself on the back and going, yeah, I'm going to use that word there because I was able to do something as good as the Australians did and make a darn boomerang. But – Here's Bill, and if I were to go to, um, if I were go to where, if he would go to the factories where they're, go to the places where they're making the stuffs in the factories, right? And no one would help him. No one wanted to finance Bill. They saved him a thousand dollars. Remember, I think some of you might even post this in the chat that they got on their Harley Davidson or some kind of motorbike, right? There it is. And in that picture, Bill's driving, right? But uh, sometimes you know, Lois is driving and Bill's in the sidecar, which is hilarious, right? So Bill would go and find out what they're working on, these factories. And he would go and invest in these low stocks. And he actually became a millionaire over this whole thing because he, he has – I think they would call that insider trading today. I'm not sure. Like you go – like I have factories that I service that are my customers. I'm not allowed to take pictures inside of there, you know, and steal their ideas and go sell them to somebody else. That would be – insider trading and I would probably go to jail for that. But uh, Bill got paid very well by purchasing these stocks at very low price. Uh, the market went crazy, right? And uh, he was able to, um, and in the sense of it was going up and up and Bill and Lowe's had purchased that motorbike. And remember this motorbike too, back in those days, it was a real motor. I mean, it was spewing oil, parts would fall off. It's not like the Harley Davidson's, the Hondas, the Suzuki's, the Yamaha's that we have today. This is very, uh, thrilling for them and somehow driven by them to do this. And, and is in that picture, Lois is driving, Bill's in the sidecar, 
Um, wonder why. Maybe Bill was a little too drunk to drive. Just a thought. So by the time he'd completed the course, he knew the law wasn't for me. I'm sure the fact that he'd barely passed um, wasn't helping with his mindset. But really here, he was really allured by what was going on in Wall Street. Remember, Bill had this tremendous ego that was growing. He wants to be the head of enterprise. He wants to be a mover and a shaker. He wants a bunch of dough. And in, in our country at the time, Wall Street was, you know, as David was talking about, was really in a tizzy and was just spiraling, spiraling up. One thing that we love as alcoholics, as addicts, we love that instant gratification. We love that fast result. Bill was spying this. He was identifying it. I can be big and rich and powerful in a hurry if I can, you know, get involved with Wall Street. And David talked about this concept of, of insider trading. And, you know, none of us knows exactly what the laws were back then. But I think David's got, you know, sort of the right perspective on this. And, it, and, it's, and we're not talking about this to suggest that Bill was doing anything wrong per se, because I, I don't think it was wrong then. Rather, this was a very ingenious approach that he was doing. And if you remember, you know, the movie Wall Street from the 80s, Michael Douglas, this was about insider trading. They were following people around to see what kind of deals they were making. Right. So that then they could go and invest and get the appreciation and cash out. So Bill was ahead of his time with his sort of deviousness and ingenuity, figure out what was happening and how he could take advantage of it and make some dough. So a little note from Howard on the boomerang. The boomerang is made uh, that he made is hanging over the fireplace of stepping stones. So go check it out, guys. Bill and Lois is home in New York. And Debbie is saying he whittled the boomerang out of a headboard. Guys, love well, all the contributions that. everybody's making yeah. here. Thank you for, for bringing good uh, historical That's stuff, and I love all the pictures, too. Great contributions, everybody. Seriously. I mean, what a what are the benefits of Zoom, right? We wouldn't be able to collaborate like this if we were sitting around the in the church basement. Okay. Bottom of page two. We gave up our positions, and off we roared on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuffed with tent, blankets, a change of clothes, and three huge volumes of a financial reference service. Our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. Perhaps they were right. I had had some success at speculation, so we had a little money, but we once worked as a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. That was the last honest manual labor on my part for many a day. We covered the whole eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there in the use of a large expense account. The exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. I have the definition of lunacy, which is defined as insane and wild foolishness. So our friends thought a insane commission should be appointed. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe Ashton can find us the medical definition of lunacy or lunatic, too. It does seem really in insane to do something like this. But then again, this is 1920s, guys. Like, you know. Things are a little safer back then, and Bill had a drive, right? He also had an ego that was driving him, and he had a vision. Bill was a visionary. Bill was a big visionary. I mean, read the – study the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He really wanted to take this places beyond even the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He wanted to make this about emotional sobriety. He wanted to make this, like, really, like, drive home what all these steps can do in our lives. And I think they do for us who study it. I don't know that they, I, I know a lot of people myself that don't live in the disciplines of 10 and 11 and 12. And I am just coming to a place in all these 24 hours of sobriety, understanding that a conscious contact with God is vital for me. I have to have that in step 11. But Bill, again, was a visionary. You know, as you can see, Bill, he builds it up. And as we're going to read, he's going to tear it down. This is alcoholism, guys. I relate to this. Please look at the identification here, the relatability of this. Build, build up. There were times I was floating on a cloud financially and, and emotionally and spiritually 
long before I, I had, I, I can admit I was an alcoholic or I needed the rooms of AA long before that. But as we'll read and we'll get into that in the next paragraph, another progression is going to hit us. So remember the paragraph before, because we're seeing a little more of this now, just from sort of a historical perspective, but also from the, the ego perspective. Uh, we covered living modestly. My wife and I saved $1,000. It went into certain securities, then cheap and rather unpopular. I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. Is there anything worse for an alcoholic still in their cups than being right about something? Every time I was right, all it did was fuel my continued self-propulsion. My chip, the chip of my shoulder was always massive. I always believed I was right. And when I was actually right, it just reinforced that ego. And that's what we're seeing with Bill now. So he had a little success there. And then what happened? Well, he had this cockamamie idea. The wife and I are going to get on a motorcycle with a few financial books and change of clothes in a tent. And we're going to get out to all these factories. And we're going to figure out what's going on. And it's going to result in a lot of dough for us. He was right again. He came back and uh, sold those reports to Wall Street, the same people who on the front end said, no thanks, Bill, don't need your help. All of a sudden he comes back and looks like a genius and a hero. And for all the money that Bill made, I'm quite certain those people that hired him uh, on his return made even you know 10 or 100 fold times that kind of money. Ended up getting him a position in the use of a large expense account Expense accounts are not as frequent today. So some of you guys who are not even familiar with them, like when the economy started, we started having some of these crashes, like in the early 2000s and stuff, and big businesses started slashing spending. A lot of, of the concept of expense accounts in many industries went away. It was basically, you were sort of a, a manager or an executive in a company, and you could go and spend, you know, sort of for the purposes of entertaining clients. And it used to be quite large in many major corporations. Right. So he's basically being said, you're going to have this great job. We're going to give you money to spend with probably low accountability. What a perfect position for a worsening alcoholic. And then he says the exercise of an option brought in more money. So he keeps getting it right. So a stock option, guys, not savvy financially, not that I am. So I barely understand the stuff that I'm going to describe to you. It's the right to purchase stock at a particular price by a certain date. So if you exercise that option, you can buy it at a certain price, right? Versus if you just go to your stockbroker today and say, you know, I want to buy IBM, you just buy it at whatever price it is. But an option, you can say, I want to buy it at a certain price on, you know, in the future. So Bill was right earlier about uh, some of these cheap, unpopular securities. He believed if he went on the road and he was going to get all this intel, he's going to be able to make money. He was right about that. And then he exercised some options, you know, maybe related to one of these other sets of research he's done. And that worked out well for him as well. So Bill is rolling. All his ego, all his grandiosity, all his thoughts of moving and shaking. The worst thing in the world is happening for him. For the next few years, think about this statement, guys. For the next few years, fortune through money and applause my way. I had arrived my judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions the great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life there was loud talk in the jazz places uptown everyone spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair weather friends. So guys, first of all, you know, I've been sort of rolling and rousing up to this point. It is the worst thing that has happened to Bill is he keeps getting it right. Because now his ego, he can barely contain it inside his skull. Fortune, throwing money and applause his way. I had arrived. My judgment, my ideas were followed by many. People are listening to me. I was right. I knew I was going to be important. And it was followed by many to the tune of paper millions. I don't know, Sam, if you get the expression paper millions. Yes, no? 
Okay, so you make a lot of money in the stock market on paper. It means you bought the stock for 10 bucks, the market blew up, it went up to 100. You got a $90 gain on that stock if you sell it. But while you don't sell it, while it's just sitting in your account, it's just called paper money because it's not worth anything until you actually sell it and take that appreciation. So the great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. So the, the, the stock market's on fire and Bill is doing incredibly successfully in it. What's the progression here? Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. What's the introspection here? Drink is now important in his life. It's not just something he's been doing. We know how this is going to turn out. We're watching the progression, but this is at the, his point of self-realization. It's now a part of his life. It's not just something he's doing. And exhilarating, though, he's still getting the effect produced. It, the effect is probably eluding him a little bit, but he's still getting some of that effect produced. And there's just a little bit more color here sort of around what's happening in the economy. Loud talk in the jazz places. Everyone's spent in thousands and chattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. So who cares what people think? You know, I'm making money. I made a host of fair weather friends. Hmm. Sam, you have fair weather friends? No, I'm sorry. I'm throwing these at you. I should have given them to you ahead of time. You got no, that I one do. Or no, you yeah, do? Okay. I do. I'll stop talking so, then because I jumped you. Go ahead. You're fine. You're fine. Um, fair weather friends is friends who stop being friends in the time of difficulty. So they're basically just there for you for the good times. Um, so let's and pause then... for a sec. Let's pause for a sec. Anybody here? Lose some friends as soon as you stop drinking and drugging. Yeah, show of hands. Yeah, hundred percent. Fair weather friends. When uh, when we were buying or we were supplying, there's always lots of people around, right? As soon as we stopped, as soon as we became no fun, people went away. It's amazing how quickly so many people dropped out of my life, and it was is meaningless to me. By the same token, some of my buddies who were Guys that I partied with back in the day, you know, I, I bring them up periodically, college buddies, fraternity buddies of mine, still friends today. Those guys stuck with me. They respect what I'm doing. Not fair weather friends, real friends. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed some of those relationships as well. Let me give you one example of that. I think I got this from Howard from his study on Sundays. Uh, so how about uh, calling those fair weather friends Kleenex friends? They pop up, you use them, or they use you, and then you throw them away. So Kleenex friends, the same exact thing, right? <laughs> so they're not here forever, guys. That's for darn sure. And we're, we're talking about Bill's ego, too, too. David pointed all this stuff out. I had arrived. This is his ego, mm -hmm. but it's also true. We're talking about, and, and David said, talking about paper money here. So think about if you had $20,000 back in the 1920s, before the stock market crash in 1929, it'd be worth about $280,000 in paper money, just paper money. But what happens when 1929 crash? How much is that paper money worth? Nothing, zero. Paper money has no meaning behind it, no fiber at all, because you gotta know when to get out of the market and nobody did. So here's his, the second progression in Bill's drinking. Drink has become an important, exhilarating part of my life. Guys relate to that? Oh my God, I couldn't wait to get off work, go with my long life friends, sit at the bar, go do some dope in the bathroom, come back out, promise to be home by five o'clock. But man, it was exhilarating. It was exciting. There were no consequences. I'm hanging around with my bestest friends in the whole wide world. And we all have one thing in common. We talk about on page 17 of our book that we, maybe there's some problems in our lives, but that's what we have in common. We're bottom of page 17, we find out later on, that's gonna, not going to be enough that we got to have this common solution. I'm not even ready for that yet. Not even ready for that yet. I'm just living in the second progression of what Bill's talking about here. That is exhilarating and important part is alcohol in my life. Dude, on the weekends, on the weekdays, anything that ends in a Y, I'm drinking. And I love it. Sam, did you have more words? We went out of order. Yeah, I had seething and swelling, which mm. seething is raging, hot. Swelling is enlarging. So the great boom of the late 20s was raging and enlarging. So as this story is going on, 
I know what's going to happen. You guys know what's going to happen, but it's building, it's building, it's building. Even if we didn't know, now we're really feeling something's going to burst here. But what's happening at this time is I keep pointing out everything is coming up, Bill Wilson. Nothing bad is happening. And he's talking about, listen, drink is becoming, a drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. Everything here is still about the effect produced. It's working for him, right? It's a solution. It's a friend. It's a companion. No cloud on the horizon yet. He's still feeling really good about the life he's leading. What's our time check? All right, one more. Mm -hmm. My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. All right, well, that's it. That's a turn. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity, no real infidelity, so maybe it's so mild or even fake, I don't know, no real who's infidelity. Telling, who's telling this story, Bill or Lois? <laughs> yeah, exactly. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife. Help the times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. I had um, remonstrances, mm -hmm. which is protest, defined as protest. So the protests of my friends terminated in a row, and I became a lone wolf. And then sumptuous is luxurious. So there are many unhappy scenes in our luxurious apartment. So... Our crazy English language, we have many words that are spelt the same way that have different meanings and can even be pronounced a little differently. So if you notice, I said the remonstrances of my friends terminated in a, in a row. Sam said row. I believe the way this was in, so you kind of read it a couple of ways. So the protest, so my drinking assumed more serious proportions. So I'm drinking all day and every night. The protest of my friends, my friends are saying, hey, stop all terminated, all stopped, they could say in a row, which means sort of one after the next. But what I think this is really saying is sort of row, which is like an argument, a fight. So the protests of my friends who are probably coming to me and saying, Bill, take it easy. You shouldn't be doing this. Not good for you. Turns into a fight because what do I need more? The friends or the alcohol? Well, Bill needed the alcohol. So gets in an argument and became a lone wolf. because Nobody wants to be around that alcoholic. Many unhappy scenes. I mean, this is a very serious turn, this progression that Bill's having right now. Everything was going great. Drink was important. Now the drink is turning on him. And this whole thing you heard us sort of laughing and chuckling and interspersing, he's talking about no real infidelity or loyalty to his wife, blah, 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 blah. I don't believe it, but that's what he wrote. Oh, so, yeah, here it is, the progression of the disease. My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continue all day and almost every night. You guys relate to that? Progression of this disease. This is my life. This is what happened to me. I, once I started, I couldn't stop. Once I stopped, I couldn't stay stopped. And then these friends in this row are, are lining up and telling him, Bill, this is a really bad idea. Well, I'll just become a lone wolf. I'll just change friends. That's mm -hmm. what I did until there was no one left but the gutter. That's how my story goes. This is, and it builds out to the gutter. Yeah, we're only on page three. But that was there was nobody left for me. And, and then it talks about, I have this word underlined. There, are, there were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. Underline that word sumptuous, right? This is ego. This is him talking about what a wonderful way I live, justifying maybe some bad behavior because he'd come home drunk and they were getting big, big roars, fights in their home. Because Bill's drunk again, you know, and stealing her hope constantly. This is my identification for me, for sure. And there have been no real infidelity, please. There either is or there isn't. There's either God is or there isn't, right? I mean, come on, guys. I, I don't get – there's no offense on that, but I'm not judging Bill here. He does say, though, uh, and I, I relate to this, being so damn drunk. But if I'm so damn drunk, how much do I remember? You know, how about any of this? Any of you guys call up your old buddies from a party you're at and ask them, like, how it was, how, you, how things were last night? Because you need to know, because you don't remember mm. the blackout. 
You remember that? Yeah. No one ever said, hey, thanks for keep cleaning my kitchen, dude. I really appreciate that. You really did a great job. No, that's not what happened. I, I, I puked in their bathroom and I didn't clean up, you know, or, or I stole shit out of their medicine cabinet because there was dope in there. It's like, that's what I did. So, uh, yeah, just I'm looking for the progressions. I'm looking for the progression of the disease. I'm looking for identification. I'm looking for things I can relate to here. So I'm not looking for differences. Like, the more we get into this chapter, up to page eight, the more I identify. All right. 